Beth. And I'm Martin. Welcome to the STEM in 30 Mission Debrief, all about Apollo 12. Today we are joined by space history curator Tizo Mule Harmony and by Apollo 12 commander Pete Conrad's wife, Nancy Conrad. Thank you so much for being here today. We will be taking all of your questions today. Submit them in the comments section on Facebook or head over to Twitter. Send us a tweet. We want to know what questions you have, and we want to see if you can stump our experts. Mm. Before we get started, let's take a quick look at STEM in 30 and our last program on Apollo 12. Charles Pete Conrad, Richard Gordon, Alan Bean, the crew of Apollo 12, the second manned landing on the face of the moon. Two. One, zero, all engines running. 37 seconds into launch, the astronauts saw a flash of white light and were jolted. Fuel cell lights and AC bus light, fuel cell just connect, AC bus overload, one and two, main bus A and B out. The Saturn V rocket had been struck by lightning. At that moment, it didn't look good for a second moon landing. The command module was overloaded by the lightning strikes. All the systems crashed, and it was relying on battery backup. We are learning all about this historic mission 50 years later. What happened after the lightning strike? What caused the electrical discharge? And what is the legacy of Apollo 12? If you want to learn more about Apollo 12, our latest episode is on our Facebook page and on the website. Be sure to check that out. And again, we will be taking questions from the online audience, and I think we might have some questions in-house as well. So think about those questions. Uh, I've got a couple to get us started. Um, <clears throat> Teasel, how long were Conrad and Bean on the surface of the moon? Was it longer or shorter than Apollo 11? It was longer, so um, they landed on the 19th of November uh, and they took off on the 20th, um, so somewhat similar to um, Armstrong and Aldrin, uh, but they actually did two EVAs, so two moonwalks, um, and so they, they walked on the moon for a little less than four hours, then they slept for about seven hours while they tried to sleep, <laughs> and then they walked on the moon again, um, and so they were able to conduct more scientific experiments and, and collect more material than the earlier mission. And that was considered a very precision landing. Like, can you put that into perspective for us? Like, how good was that? It's sort of mind bending. I, I don't even know if I can, because I, I find it it's so shocking. But they were trying to land really close to a Surveyor 3, which was a lunar probe. And they actually got in less than 600 feet from Surveyor 3. So they were able to walk over to it once they landed. So remarkably precise. Nancy, was that something Pete was proud of? Oh, it was just with his whole day, you know. He was so excited when he saw it there, when they opened the door from the limb, and there it was. And of course, Alan had seen it as they were navigating down to the lunar surface, so it made their whole day. We actually, getting off to a great start already, we've got Emma, who is eight, mm -hmm. and what advice, and I'm gonna pitch this to you, Nancy, because you can talk a little bit about Pete's background, but okay. what advice would do you have for a, an aspiring astronaut? Ah. Uh. An aspiring astronaut needs discipline and creativity. And you might think that that's an, an oxymoron. You might think that those are two totally opposite things. But you have to be nimble in the way you think. And you also have to have discipline and be precise. So how do you do a landing on a lunar surface that's 240,000 miles from Earth and pinpoint that? That's all navigation systems. And you also have to have well, the what if mindset. What if it wasn't exactly there? What would you do? How would you maneuver the vehicle so that you could make a successful landing? And you, you've talked a little bit earlier about uh, Pete's road to becoming an astronaut was mm -hmm. not always the straight trajectory that, that one might think. It was very bumpy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Pete had a, um, a, a difficulty learning. He had trouble reading and spelling and he was at this very prestigious school and he just had trouble reading and spelling. So they didn't know what dyslexia was in those days and so they thought he was stupid and he was flunking everything and so they expelled him. And his mom took him to a little school in upstate New York uh, that's known to deal with so-called problem children and they had master at this school 
saw something special in Pete, and really Pete's whole life became the recognition from that headmaster. You know, I think all young people need someone that believes in them, and sometimes you have to do that for yourself. And so for Pete, it was this headmaster, and Pete was learning how to fly at about the same time, and he ended up with a scholarship to Princeton. It was compliments of the Navy, and by the way, the Navy will give you a scholarship to university and will pay your way. You owe them some time, which he was happy to do. And uh, Princeton was also one of the uh, scholarships that he was awarded. He became an aeronautical engineer. Uh, there were two very good reasons for that. He liked to fly and he didn't have to read or spell. <laughs> <laughs> so it worked out really well for Pete. And then he went on to become a test pilot and four flights in space and Congressional Space Medal of Honor and all kinds of amazing accomplishments from there. All right, we've, we've got another question from Sarah here, and, and I want to ask it to both of you because I think the answer may be different. I think it's going to be interesting. She wants to know what the scariest thing about a lunar mission was. So Teasel, start with us and, and knowing about these missions and how complex they were, what was the scariest part of that mission? It's hard to choose one part because these missions were so complex and every single step had to go right. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if for Apollo 12 it was being struck by lightning on the launch yeah. because that introduced all these more unknowns. Um, and one of the things that astronauts weren't completely aware of was that there was a question of whether or not their parachutes would even work when they were returning back to Earth. Um, and uh, they decided, well, we, there's no way to find out, so we might as just as well continue with the mission. But um, yeah, the, the, uh, with Apollo 12 having um, being struck by lightning at the launch was probably pretty terrifying, um, uh, unexpected, and uh, but they, they recovered quite quickly. Did Pete ever talk about being scared as, as an astronaut? Um, I think he had a very healthy respect for how dangerous the mission was and how dangerous everything he was doing. Uh, he, he really had a healthy respect for it. I think all the guys did, really. I don't think that was unusual, but I do think with the Apollo 12, you know, the, they had trained for one or two caution and warning lights lighting up, and this thing looked like a Christmas tree inside. It just was all lit up. The whole panel was lit up. And that had to really get their attention. And he had a two minute abort, and his hand was on the abort and didn't pull it. Now, he could have, but the confidence in the team down at Mission Control, and he knew they were working the problem, and I think that gave him some comfort. And the fact that Albine knew where the switch was was <laughs> really a good thing. Hazel, tell us about the abort, though. Like, that was not an easy thing. Like, they didn't know if that would work, did they? Um, well, it, if they did it soon enough, that it, it would it would have likely worked. Um, and uh, but. You know, they didn't want to, to lose that opportunity to go to the moon. No one wanted um, the abort to happen. And fortunately, um, Mission Control was able to come up with a solution really quickly, and Albine knew where that switch was. And um, so it, they were able to solve the problem quickly enough to save the mission. What, uh, this is another uh, online question. Uh, I think it's probably from Sarah, who's paying a lot of attention. Oh, good, Sarah. Um, <clears throat> How or what did Apollo 12 build off of Apollo 11? So what did they learn uh, from Apollo 11 that they then used? That is a really great question. So yeah. Teasel, do you want to start us off on that? Well, the, um, the scientists requested that the astronauts focus more on picking up uh, moon rocks as opposed to dust. And so with, with Apollo 11, the, uh, the astronauts brought a lot of the lunar dust home, um, which, is, which was useful for study, but the scientists really wanted to see more rocks, and so that was one of the changes that they had made between 11 and 12. Well, it, and they took science to the moon. They measured moon quakes. This is when we found out that the moon is a thermos bottle. It's got a solid core, an air, and then an outer surface to it. And the pinpoint landing was monumental because Buzz and Neil were four miles from their landing site. They could have spoiled their whole day, so uh, they were just about out of fuel. So the pinpoint landing was crucial to that. And then they took magnetometers and seismometers, and science left Earth for the first time, and we really began to understand the moon. And they landed uh, near a Copernican ray, the ocean of storms. I love that title, <laughs> the ocean of storms. Um, and it was a deep crater so that they could get rocks and things from deep within the surface of the moon. 
It was a great scientific expedition. And these, the astronauts knew each other. So did you oh. hear any stories about, you know, maybe Neil said to, to Pete, hey, look, this is what you need to be. Yeah, I don't know of any of that stuff, but I do know that the crew of Apollo 12 was unique. They were best friends. They were best friends before they went. Dick and, and, and uh, Dicky Dicky we used to call him, <laughs> and Pete were, were best pals. They were Navy uh, guys. It was an all Navy crew. And they were best buddies before they left Earth. They were best buddies on the moon. They were best buddies their whole lives. And now they're all together at Arlington Cemetery. Well, a bunch of these questions are coming in from Gahana, Ohio. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know the teacher's name. Sarah is the first name, but thank you for sending the questions <laughs> in. These are some awesome questions, and it looks like um, Emily wants to know, why did they launch Apollo 12 when there was a storm going on? At the time, they didn't quite realize um, there was as much of a risk as they, they learned, and that's one of the, they learned a lot from Apollo 12. One of the things is, you know, yeah best not to launch in that uh, in a thunderstorm is an important thing to learn. Yeah, um, it was they, the first and only time that they launched in foul weather, yeah. never again. But um, there was a lot of uh, sort of, the Saturn V rocket was really reliable and um, it went off on time and scheduled. If you, if you uh, were following any of the shuttle launches, you know that often they were delayed or scrubbed. Or, um, but with, with the Saturn V, with the Apollo launches, um, they were on time. Um, and it was less dependent on weather. And uh, it's Miss Hanson's Ms. class. Miss Hanson's class. Uh, what were the biggest challenges while they were on the moon? They learned a few things um, that would be helpful for later missions, especially about uh, working in a spacesuit. So they they realized that their mouths got really dry. I, I, you know with um, pure oxygen that they were breathing and, and they were working hard uh, for multiple hours on the lunar surface. And so future missions would add a way to drink water. Um, and uh, th so they had some feedback. They also noticed that it was really hard to see and so they added the sun visor too. But they were able to you know, report back and say, this would make the moonwalk a lot easier if we did these updates for the spacesuits. And are the things that they learned with Apollo, are those gonna influence us going back to the moon and onto Mars? Oh, sure. I mean, Pete said one of the things that was the clunkiest of the suits was the gloves. They, you know, hands need a lot of movement in them, and the gloves were just massive and clunky. And so I think that's one of the things they're really designing to now as we continue to explore. I think this is another um, one from Ms. Hansen's class. And the question is, what did it feel like to see the Earth from space? And maybe we could talk about Earthrise and what it felt like to people here when we first started to see that. Can, can I speak about yeah, that, please? Yeah, please do. So I think all of the guys, I, I've never heard an exception to this, when they saw Earth from deep space, they all looked at it as this fragile blue marble that was suspended in a black velvet sky. No borders, no boundaries. And I think what's so interesting today is that we have Gen Z who all connect through the internet and see Earth in very much the same way. And our particular work that we do with students is primarily with Gen Z kids, 13 to 18. Why don't you tell us a little bit about oh, the sure. Conrad Foundation? So, so we host uh, the Conrad Foundation. Um, that we're in our 14th year and we invite teams of high school students, 13 to 18, to really design the future. And they do that by creating commercially viable products, solving global and local challenges. They work in aerospace, energy, cybersecurity, health, smoke-free world, and ed tech. And it's really there to, to give kids their moonshot. So we take them under our wing and we give them their opportunity to participate as designers of the future. And they come up with some amazing, amazing <laughs> innovations. All right, we've got another question from uh, a classroom. And if we can pull up one of the pictures of the astronauts on the moon, I think it's gonna fit this really well. Can you see the stars from the moon when you're walking on the moon? Do I take that? Depends on how much um, sun is in your eyes, I think. And with this crew in particular, they, the sun was very bright and it was at a different angle. Uh, 
or sort of, uh, than, than any of the other missions. So Apollo 12, um, they had actually quite a bit of difficulty seeing on, on the lunar surface. And th but that was designed in their mission to be there basically on the bright side, of, you know, on, the, right. on the, the brighter side of the moon while they were doing their missions, right? Mm -hmm. They would always time um, the lunar landings with um, the sun at a particular angle um, to not only illuminate the surface, but also to make sure that um, the, the texture of the surface was illuminated too, if you think about all the shadows and things like that. So it was important for them not to uh, fall down and you wouldn't want to trip on a rock. and. Um, so the angle of the sun in relationship to the moon was important as well um, for the timing of each of these missions. Well, and unfortunately, Al Bean pointed the camera right at the sun and it burned it out. So the, uh, you will notice that there are no images from the moon that were sent back to Earth from Apollo 12. But there was a painting. Do you want to tell yes. us this story? Yes, well, this is so <laughs> great. So as I mentioned, these guys were best buddies and they were characters and they were pranksters and they liked fun. And they were having fun. And so Pete and Al stowed away a tripod. And they were going to take a picture of the two of them on the moon, which would have driven NASA and everybody in the world completely bananas, because how are you going to do that? Who's up there, you know? Some guy. Um, so they had stowed away this tripod. And they packed up everything to get ready for the ascent off of the lunar surface. And they couldn't find the tripod. So they're running around like two crazy people looking for this tripod. They're going to take off the Hasselblad and mount it. And they're sweating and their heart rates are going up. And mission control is going bananas. What's wrong with these guys? And finally they said, guys, you got to just get back in the limb and go for it. So they got back to Earth. And sure enough, in the rock box with the 78 pounds of rock was a tripod. <laughs> so that would have been the world's first selfie, by the way. Um, on the moon. On the moon. <laughs> on the moon. Uh, there were no selfies in those days. No. We didn't know about selfies. There wasn't even that word. So um, Al Bean, in honor of that, painted it. He was an artist. And so he painted that. And he actually painted all three of them on the lunar surface. It's a sweet painting. And, and just an honor to their wonderful friendship. Nice. Yeah. Teasley, you're an expert on Apollo and, and technology. As the technology improves, are we going to go past the moon and to Mars and even beyond? Well, that's the hope. And um, that's what people are working on um, today is, well, when, when you're talking about human exploration, right now the, for the United States, the major focus is the moon, but with the expectation that that is going to prepare us then to go on to Mars and perhaps other places in the future. Uh, Mrs. Hansen's class is very busy today. <laughs> uh, what are the different things they did on the moon? How far did they walk? How many pounds of rocks did they collect? If we want to talk a little bit about some of the science. Do you want me to do that? Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they had seismometers, magnetometers, they had plutonium on the moon, and that was to generate the energy for the magnetometers, I think. Help me on this, mm -hmm. yes? For the whole, the yeah. whole. Yeah, and, the, and the plutonium was stuck in this cylinder that it was transported in and so <laughs> Pete talked about getting the Mach 7 super scientific weapon that was going to get out the plutonium out of its casement and it was a hammer so he clopped it with a <laughs> hammer and, and the plutonium fell out and they were able to gin up the energy for the, the magnetometers. So th they discovered moon quakes when they left the lunar surface they could measure how the, the quaking of the moon, like an earthquake, but a moon quake. They, um, some of the other experiments. Solar wind experiment. The solar wind. Designed yep. in Switzerland. Yep. Um, so, yeah, an important selection of, of scientific instruments. Um, and that, that we're recording data for years and years and years after they left the moon. Um, the Apollo 11 mission had a, a, a simpler, smaller sort of package of scientific instruments. And the Apollo 12 crew really um, set up a much more extensive array, and, and then also the, the lunar material they collected. It was primarily basalt, um, which is volcanic rock. I want to mention that 25 years ago, I worked with two young people, and we did a comic book called Moonshot, The Flight of Apollo 12. And NASA has very kindly downloaded that electronically, so all the kids can read that comic book, and every detail that you would want to know about the mission of Apollo 12 is in that comic book. 
and it's on the NASA website. So I encourage these classes to go look at that comic book. There's also interviews there with Dick Gordon and LB, and there's an Ask Captain Pete section <laughs> as well. And we'll be posting a lot of that to the STEM and 30 uh, Facebook page as well. Um, so we talked about the experiments that they did on the moon. The moon rocks that they brought back, I just saw an article the other day that they're just opening some of these moon rocks yeah. from these missions and studying them now. Tisa, why is that? Why, why wait 50 years to look at these rocks? Well, 50 years ago, they realized that scientific instruments were going to improve over time. And they knew that what they were able to find 50 years ago when they examined the rocks might be different you know, with improved technology um, 50 years out or even farther out than that. So they kept a lot of that lunar material sealed. Um, ready and waiting for, for future investigation. And, and we have actually learned much more about um, this lunar material than we were able to 50 years ago. So um, our instruments 50 years ago weren't able to detect any traces of water, um, and more contemporary instruments have found some traces of water in this material. And teachers, if you're, if you're interested in moon rocks, NASA actually has a program where you can check out disks of moon rocks and meteorites and have them shipped to your classroom, and it's kind of awesome that you've got this disk with moon rocks in it that you can have your kids cool. look at and study and, and do some really cool stuff with it. Cool. So uh, one of the questions that's come in is, <clears throat> what was the feeling like for them to take the first steps on the moon? Now, we'll say that Neil Armstrong's first words were, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But Nancy, do you want to tell us what Pete's first <laughs> words were? Pete's first words on the moon were whoopee. <laughs> They had done a pinpoint landing, and he was just happy as a clam that that had happened. And then he had a friend who was an Italian journalist who was convinced that our government had written Neil's words, and he said, absolutely not, and you and I are going to create what I'm going to say, and when I say it, you're going to pay me 500 bucks when I come back. So those words were that may have been a small one for Neil, but it was a big one for me. <laughs> and he came back, and... She never paid him the 500 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I actually put that in my book, and I got a, a sort of a letter from her, from her lawyer, that she was going to sue me if I told that story. I pulled it out of my book. I wished I'd have kept it. It would have sold a lot of books. <laughs> well, I think one of the things that I like about that story was the first moon landing. It was very serious and mm -hmm. very somber, but the, the next one was like, well, hey. we've done this. Let's have fun. Yeah. And the crew did have a good time They had a together. great time. They had a blast. It was their, their grand adventure with their best friends. Yeah. Tiesel, I've seen, and we've got a question from a, a class about this, and I've seen some of these in the collection. Tell us about the food that <laughs> they took along to the moon with them. And it, it, the ones that I've seen in the collection don't look all that delicious. <laughs> well, uh, 50 years out, they definitely don't look that good. <laughs> um, <laughs> But they did work really hard to make things as appetizing as possible. When they were traveling in space to the moon, they were able to actually heat up their food. That was one improvement that was added to the Apollo program from the earlier missions. Uh, and I was reading a story about them eating spaghetti um, and they, that they seemed to enjoy. Uh, on the moon, though, all the food was cold. Um, and, uh, but the selection of food, they tried to suit the astronauts' taste, make sure that they had things they liked um, throughout all the Apollo missions. One of the most popular items was uh, sort of bacon squares. Uh, when you're in space, you can't yeah. taste food quite as well. And so um, things that are salty or spicy tend to be more appetizing, more appealing. But they had things like um, coffee and pudding and um, stews and sort of tang. All, uh, tang, all, <laughs> well, all sorts of food that, um, that you have on Earth uh, but prepared for uh, eating in space. Bacon squares, I think I'm going to have that for lunch today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Emma wants to know if they brought anything special to the moon, like stuffed animals or anything like that. Now, you have yeah. so, a story. Yes. Um, the original crewmate on Apollo 12 was a, a pilot named C.C. Williams. He was a Marine pilot. And C.C. was killed um, prior to the flight of Apollo 12. And so Pete and Albie took C.C. Williams' marine wings to the moon. So there is a marine on the moon. Yeah, an homage to C.C. Williams. I don't know that they took anything else. Um, some guys took pictures and this and that. But Al Bean, I, uh, 25 years ago, I, I interviewed a bunch of the guys for a book that NASA published. 
And I asked each of them to write their own epitaph. And that was the last question in the interview. And Al Bean said, first to eat spaghetti on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he loved his spaghetti. His whole life it was all about spaghetti. And in fact, at Alan's funeral, what did we all eat? Spaghetti. spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've learned a lot about the, the, the crew and, and how much fun they had. They also had kind of a mascot, didn't they? The Snoopy, is that what you're talking about? No, no a, what? a rather large, hairy, oh, furry mascot. Oh, the gorilla. <laughs> it was the Apollo Next 9 mascot. And they used to take that, oh, there he is in the corner. Um, they used to take that around quite a bit. And in fact, they had it driving the car. Some guy got into it and drove the car. They also had a mysterious astronaut that never was there for interviews. He was the son of a Romanian prince. And they made up this whole story. and I can't remember what they gave the guy's name. Mm, it'll come to me. Pete had an imaginary friend, too, named Irving Fenoric. <laughs> <laughs> and he talked a lot about Irving Fenoric. And if you're an eagle-eyed viewer and you go back to the STEM and 30 episodes, see if you can catch where the gorilla makes an appearance in the show. show. We had a couple people actually find it when we when we. There you go. It. Yep. <laughs> um, Teasel, maybe you know this. What is the difference between moon rocks and space rocks? So I think that's probably referring to rocks that come specifically from the moon or um, rocks that come from all sorts of different types of bodies in the outer space. Um, so you can have meteorites, for instance, I bet, or um, Mars rocks. So uh, space rocks would just be a larger, more general category. Moon rocks is a, about a specific location. How do we know the difference between things that have come from space and the rocks here on Earth. How can we tell if it's a meteorite or that it came from Mars or? Well, usually it'll take um, looking into the composition of the rock. And so when the moon rocks came back to Earth, they were put on display, a lot of museums and other, other types of exhibits, and people were surprised because they looked just like Earth rocks, which is a little disappointing. But the actual mm. material of them was, was a bit different. So the volatile elements um, had been lost uh, on, on the lunar surface through that process, and then also the dating of them and things like that. So there are clues, um, but it takes geologists, chemists to, to um, be able to detect them. We've got another question here. Um, Pete flew into space more than once. Mm -hmm. Walking on the moon, was that his favorite mission? Actually, his favorite mission was Skylab because it challenged him the most. It was the launch of our first space station, went up in two parts. Uh, the, the lab went up in the first launch and then there was a rendezvous and it was Skylab 2 that rendezvoused with, with Skylab 1. And there were solar arrays that were too open to cool the uh, lab and it was equipped for a 28 day mission with all the food and all the goodies in there, which by the way, they had a full menu six days, rotation, lobster, everything they wanted to eat. It was like, you know, <coughs> hotel in space. And especially compared to the sardine cans they'd been flying in Gemini. But it was damaged. The solar array was, was shut tight and the copper um, band that was across it didn't open. So it fell on the crew to rescue the lab. And they had all these very advanced equipment called a shepherd's crook that we used to repair phone poles with. Probably you kids don't even know what a phone <laughs> pole is, but we used to have phone poles. And so they were yanking and yanking, and he was tied to a tether into the Saturn V. And he's yanking this thing with this shepherd's crook, and it opened. And the array opened up like a huge fan, and Pete flew backwards. And he said at one point he was pretty sure he was going to be the first arrow ever launched in space because <laughs> he wasn't sure if that, if that tether was going to hold or not. So actually he ended up being awarded the Congressional Space Medal of Honor for rescuing the lab. That's not bad for a kid who <laughs> <laughs> got expelled in the 11th grade, right? Not yeah. bad at all. So why was that mission so important? So that was the first American space station, and um, they were able to learn about the effects of long-duration spaceflight on the human body. So um, that mission that Pete was on was 28 days. The next mission was about two months. The next one after that, about three months. And so 
Um, we learned a lot about what living and working in space is like. There you can see exercising in space is necessary. Uh, that was a stationary bike with some resistance uh, to maintain muscle mass. And then we also did a lot of scientific research um, in those missions, um, especially related to the sun. We learned a lot about the sun, and that was also a really, really important moment to get people more interested in studying the sun. And then um, Earth observation as well. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. If you're watching online, thanks for submitting all the questions today. You all had some great questions. And be sure to tune in next month as we take an in-depth look at simple machines. Thanks, thanks for, for watching. watching.